This podcast is Challenging Opinions and is presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading the Challenging Opinions podcast for July 16th, 2018. For centuries, China has been a source of mystery, fascination and suspicion for the West. And that certainly hasn't changed with the economic rise of China. In this show, I'm going to discuss how each side views the other with an expert in international affairs who's actually from China. Challenging Opinions is the podcast where ideas are tested. Whether you are left or right, conservative or progressive, devout or skeptic. What matters is the strength of your argument, not the strength of your voice. Coming up on today's podcast. Chinese people basically accepted this bar, this grand bargain with the government, basically saying, you know, you are free to, to a certain level to pursue economic freedom, but we're going to control you everything else in terms of political freedom. Is it possible that they're looking back at what happened to Gorbachev in the, uh, in the 19, 19- 80s. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And even President Xi, that when he talked to the communist uh, a member party members, he's very much you know stressed about the lessons they learned from the former Soviet Union. We'll have that full interview in a few minutes' time. Are the problems of the world getting you down? Then join the Death Saving Bros as they try to right the wrongs in the realm of Ralvaria. Right the wrongs? Don't we just wind up making everything so much worse? Ah, yeah, and then we go and try to fix them. I don't know about fixing them. We'll just leave that up to the dice. Death Saving Bros is an actual play Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition podcast focused on creative storytelling and irreverent humor. New episodes are released every Tuesday, so tune in via your podcasting app of choice for an epic quest you won't forget. Wait, is this a promo? On the line now, I have Helen Raleigh. Helen was born in China. She immigrated as a student to the United States in 1996, and she's worked there ever since in a variety of roles. She's also an author and has written many articles about China, the United States, and other topics. Helen, tell me what it was like coming as a young person from China to the U.S., it was very intimidating mm-hmm. at, at, at the beginning because I came here all by myself. I didn't know anyone here. I didn't have any family here. And it was really the first time I was so far away from home. So it was uh, quite intimidating to be alone in a different culture and speaking different language. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to say people here are very, very welcoming. And uh, I was fortunate to be in a really nice uh, community uh, on campus, people are very welcoming, so that make uh, life much easier. Would you say that your experience has brought you towards an appreciation of the American way of life, rejecting the, the communism of, at the time of China? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I wrote a book, my first book, it's called The Confucius Never Said. Mm-hmm. It's my family history, but it's also the second half of the book was about my uh, experience about immigrating to the United States by myself. Um, yes, it's such a contrast in my life here compared to the life in China, because here, even though I was all by myself, but there were several things to stand out. First of all, you know, um, as a poor student, I worked in a Chinese restaurant to help support myself. Mm-hmm. But every penny, every penny I earned, it, it's mine. You know, it's it, there's no the government forcing everybody had to make the same wages, mm-hmm. and that's that's what happened in China. So that's different. So I learned that everything I do, you know, it's mine. I'm I'm making decision about my own destiny. And the second thing re- I really noticed, really stand out. But to me is that people here are not as selfish as individualist as how it was portrayed in China. When I was, when I was in China, I was told, oh, Americans are all very selfish. You know, they only care about themselves and it's a very individualist society. And it, to, when I came here, you know, I didn't have much and there were so many people lend their helping hand to me, help me find an apartment. It lent me stuff to use, 
And uh, also, I noticed that you know when I went to church, uh, any family had you know had some troubles. Everybody jumping in to deliver food to their family, to reaching out. It seems that there's actually a very strong sense of a community here, rather than the propaganda in China saying, "Oh, everybody just care about themselves. Everybody's for themselves." That's really, really not the case. You mentioned the misperceptions that people in China have about the U.S. How about the other way around? How do you think? How well informed do you think the average American is about what life is really like in China? That's interesting too. I think their misperception goes both ways.、Um, I remember the first year I came, I was here in nineteen back in nineteen ninety six. I still get a question a lot. Uh, you know, the, do Chinese women still get bend their feet? I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> that was a practice like about hundred years ago. What's a, you know? So, it, it, you know, it's questions like that, and also the misperceptions.、Um, Especially for a Chinese women, like we're all Asian dolls,、so、we all only bow and smile and not、uh, not aggressive, not you know, do not want to speak up your your mind. That's totally not me. So when I you know when I behave the ways not like people typically expected from a Chinese.、Uh, uh, Chinese woman,、mm-hmm. I think people were a little taken back to say, "Oh, you're very different." I said, "No." I said that there are actually many, especially many young Chinese women just like me. We are very comfortable to speak out our mind, where we we can be very assertive and aggressive, you know, to pursue what we want in life. We are not that kind of a stereotyping of somebody just a smile and a bow like a quiet Asian doll. Um, you've written a lot about international issues, about trade between the U.S. and China, and.、Mm-hmm. One book that I've read, which I'm sure you're aware of, is、uh, "When China Rules the World" by Martin Jack, and his main thesis is that Chinese development just isn't like, in many respects, the development of the United States. That China is going to develop, but it's going to develop on its own terms. Do you think that that thesis is correct, and do you think that it is properly understood at the highest level of government in the U.S.? Well, I agree with that thesis, and I think, and you can tell, especially from the current administration, from China's President Xi, he compared to previous Chinese leaders,、um, he was much more bold, and he doesn't hide his ambitions about himself,、mm-hmm. and he doesn't hide his ambitions and his visions about China, and you can also、uh, tell from his foreign policies. Perspective. His foreign policy initiatives are much more aggressive, much more outward going, rather than what Deng Xiaoping, you know, advised. You know, try to hide your strengths. You know, biding your time.、Mm-hmm. I think to President Xi and the many people in China, they think it's time to be aggressive, to be bold.、Uh, you know, it's it's China's turn. So, and also China, because of the long history in China. And Chinese people, especially Chinese government, has this strong th- sense that we know what's best. So, and and, and especially since the 2008 economic crisis, that the China look at the West basically made the decision that you know what, you guys don't know what you're doing, and you don't know how to manage your economy. We know what's the best for China, for China, and we. We, you know, we're gonna follow our own, you know, destinies, and so I, I do not entirely agree with some of the approaches the governments are taking,、um, but I can understand it. It's because you know it's really a combination of、uh, the self confidence they gained from last thirty years economic development,、mm-hmm. as well as this、uh, long history of、uh, almost like a supremacy of its culture. Um, mm-hmm. If you talk to Chinese people, many of them will be very proud to tell you we had a several several thousand years of history. You know, we we have seen everything, so we know what to do. Again, I don't necessarily agree with that attitude, but I can understand it. One thing, perhaps it's not the correct way to put it, but is there a sense that perhaps you've you're moving against the tide of history when you move to the United States? Is it possible that? The U.S.'s century was the 20th century, and it is in an inevitable decline. That China will inevitably become the dominant world power, just because it's in population four times the size of the U.S. and it is economically、uh, catching up and overtaking. Well, I don't think it's inevitable、um, for either scenario you develop. I don't think it's inevitable for United States to decline or inevitable for China to rise because. Um, China is trying to put a, a basically a square peg in a round hole. 
right? China explain, on the explain. one China on the one hand benefit from some market oriented economic reform. That's what brought China today's prosperity. But at the same time, Chinese government try to contain the horse this uh um, invisible hand. The China, China's government is very is a very authoritarian government. It try to plan and control the economic movement as well as the people's movement. Not only just movement, but also the thought, the ideas, the culture. They try mm-hmm. to have a very strict control of everything, and so that goes against a free market. Eco- you know, economy. So I think China is actually hitting a bottleneck that. Um, I don't know how far China can go with currently. So far, it has been to a great, to a great deal of level. It has been successful because Chinese people basically accepted this bar, this grand bargain with the government basically saying, you know, you are free to, to a certain level to pursue economic freedom, but we're going to control you everything else in terms of political freedom. So that's, far, that's, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. I think that's, that's, one thing that's perhaps not fully understood in the West that it seems like the Chinese government is saying, okay, economic freedom is fine, but freedom of speech, right. democracy, we're not going to have that. Is it possible that they're looking back at what happened to Gorbachev in the, uh, in the 19, 19- 80s and up to 1990, whereby Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, introduced two policies, Glasnost and Perestroika. Perestroika was restructuring, that's to say to modernize the economy. Glasnost was openness, that's to say to increase democracy. Glasnost, to a degree, worked, although it's perhaps been reversed since. But Perestroika, the economic, communist economic restructuring, was a catastrophe. And the combination of that economic catastrophe and greater political openness meant that the communists were swept aside. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Chinese communist, supposedly communist government, is looking very carefully at that and saying, okay, improve the economy, but we're we're going nowhere on democracy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And even President Xi, in his internal discussion that was reported, uh, that when he talked to the communist uh, party members, he's very much you know, stressed about the lessons they learned from the former Soviet Union. That's why the Chinese government will do everything to try to stay in power. And that means they know they have to continue improve the economy because, like you mentioned earlier, China has a huge population. People will only make a sacrifice in terms of political freedom if they still have you know, making money and their standard of living is still improving. You know, everybody mm-hmm. have jobs. Once people start losing jobs, their economy is going down. That's will really shake the core of the foundation of the government. So the Chinese government knows that. That's why they are, in some ways, they are more willing to open up with the economy. But at the same time, they are doing absolutely everything they can. You know, especially today with more money in their pocket, they're using technology like artificial intelligence to mm-hmm. actually control people. Chinese people are subject to a lot more control. Even than even under Mao, because now with the technology, you know, the mm-hmm. cameras everywhere, they record, they record your license plate, they'll have your facial recognition, mm-hmm. they're building a social credit system, which basically will document all your behaviors. They know every single move you take. It's really always 1984 turning to reality. One thing about that, because I mentioned the Martin Jack book, which has been hugely influential, and one thing about that book, I thought he was very sympathetic to the Communist Party in that book. I don't know. He's a British. I don't know why he might be a communist, but I, and I don't think he is, but he was sympathetic to them. And he said that the rapid development, for example, of South Korea happened Mm -hmm. during a period when South Korea was not a democracy. The rapid development of the British economy in the Industrial Revolution happened when Britain was not anything approaching a democracy as we would recognize it. And that's quite true of the US as well. And essentially, he said that economic development must come first. Do you think that it will be possible if you have a an educated, affluent, working economy, will it really be possible to say to them, yeah, you can have all of these things that they have in the West, but not democracy? Will people accept that? I think people, well, in China's example, they are, well, first I reject that, you know, assumption. And I, I, 
but in terms of specific in China's example, there are cultural reasons. And then they are economic reasons. So there are cultural reasons because the Confucius culture has influenced China for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And Confucius culture, you know, is all about hierarchy, about everybody recognizes their, you know, predetermined place in, in the, in society. And they just follow that, follow that track. You know, you don't go outside the track, then the society will be in harmony. Mm -hmm. I think it's with the cultural influence, it's more, it's easier for Chinese people to accept the, you know, the hierarchies, the authoritarian regime. That being said, but if you look at Hong Kong, if you look at Taiwan, you know, they are also Chi Chinese people. They are with Chinese heritage and democracy is thriving, you know, in those places too. So mm -hmm. that also means that Chinese people are capable and very much desire the real democracy. Um, so I think, and it's also with the e economic, you know, improvement, actually the protests are, e the, the number of protests are increasing in China, despite the government's iron fist. You can still see there are more protests there, like people de desire for religious freedom mm -hmm. and as well as the, the rights to protest about like wage discrimination, you know, since, or, or gender is, is, uh, equality issues, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think when the government, that's why I'm saying China's uh, government is reaching a bottleneck because once people, because it's impossible to separate economic freedom versus uh, political freedom. Once people reach a certain, you know, wealth level, people will naturally demand, you know, political freedom. They naturally want to be free, not only to be able to decide what to buy, you know, next uh, tomorrow, but they also want to be able to decide, you know, what I want to think, you know, who I who I prefer to be my leader and how I want to express myself. So I think those things are just coming to into somebody naturally. Um, it. it it's, it's not a big movement or it hasn't threatened the Chinese government's uh, ruling right now, mm -hmm. but I know they worry about it. And I know there are things bubbling beneath the surface that people are desire, desiring for it. What do you think of the quality of leadership in the Communist Party? Uh, that's interesting. Depends on how you measure it. If you're asking about whether they're well educated, I think they are. Um, it's a very elitist. It's a very elitist group. Um, in China, they have this system that they basically pick uh, political leaders from very, you know, from young, develop from young. You join the young pioneer group. You join the youth group. Mm -hmm. Then they select the elite out of the elite to join the Communist Party. So in terms of yeah, education, it's quite it's quite difficult to join the Communist Party. You can't just show up and, and pay your dues. Oh, no. You have to apply and uh, no, no, get no. references and so forth. Yeah, you don't apply for it. They select you. You know, they select you. You have to meet the grade requirement. You have to meet like, you know, political requirements. Yeah. So it's a very, very elitist group. Um, but at, at the same time, they, are, they can be narrow minded. They can be, um, you know, because they, they can be just a very China centric or very uh, focused on what they want to do and they reject. Um, other people's ideas or reject a different system, reject something that's good. You know, when you asked me earlier about what do they think about Americas, what all they see are problems. Mm -hmm. um, they refuse to acknowledge that there's something very good about America. This is the reason why with only 200 years history, a little more than 200 years history, America has developed to the most uh, developed, the most advanced, you know, country in the world. You know, it has everything to do with the, the founding principles of this country that enable people, no matter what your skin color is, no matter what background you you have, you come to this land opportunity, you can make something out of yourself. And that's not something you can do in China. So I I wish the leadership will will give more, you know, credit to what the West, what uh, especially what America have to offer. Um, Donald Trump said a little while back that trade wars are simple and easy to win. Who do you think is going to win the trade war between the U.S. and China? <laughs> I don't think I don't think either side is going to win. I think they're probably going to come to some kind of truth. That's, that's correct. Actually, I agree with you that nobody ever wins a trade war, but some people no, lose. No. Some because people lose worse than others. Who do you think will lose worse? Um. Well, I guess in terms of dollar amount, probably China will lose a little more, but you will not hear it from the media only because, you know, because again, 
under President Xi, China is much more aggressive, much more assertive. So I think, you know, if you look at all the China's response so far, they're not going to lose the PR war. They're going to, in terms of, you know, the, the war, the war of wars, China going to fight back just as hard to say, well, we're not going to compromise. You know, we're going to retaliate just as hard. But if you look at it from pure dollars and cents perspective, China is much more a re- exporting economy than the United States is. So if we really have to fight a trade war, which both sides is going to lose, but China probably in terms of absolute dollar and cents, China is probably going to lose more. Uh, that's why Chinese government recognize that. Uh, you know, that's why they, they want to focus on, they have already started transition from an export oriented economy to more focus on developing internal consumption and the service industry inside China. Um, but they're not there yet. So they're still, Chinese economy is still much more relied on uh, exporting than the United States. Mm-hmm. Just looking at the Chinese people, and I don't know how much you are still in touch with China. Do you know, what do Chinese people know about the relationship that they have with the U.S. that Americans don't know? Oh, China's, Chinese people is very uh, worldly. Mm-hmm. If, I, don't know, I don't know, have you ever been to China, but if you ever been to China, even you sit in a cab, the, the cab driver will want to talk to you about the Donald Trump, will want to talk to you about the illegal immigration. The Chinese people care a lot about what's going on around the world, especially what's going on in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, years ago, there's a fascina- there was more fascination and admiration because, you know, years ago, China was much poorer. So there was a lot more admiration. Nowadays, there's prob- probably a lot more putting down and, you know, criticism because, again, with the growing economy, Chinese people gain more conf- self-confidence too. Mm-hmm. And also... Consider that the media is strictly controlled by the government, so the government probably will feed the uh, feed the uh, uh, audience, feed the Chinese people whatever uh, biased view they want them to see about the United States. So, so it's interesting that Chinese people will, on the one hand, very worldly; they want they want to know more, and they have their view about the United States. But at the same time, it's probably it would be a distorted view for many of them because they only get their information from government-controlled media. What do you think? Um, there is a phrase uh, which was developed by, um, I think, a Palestinian uh, sociologist, Edward Said, called Orientalism. And this essentially described a sort of uh, attitude in the West, a romanticized and unrealistic idea of other non-Western cultures. Do you think that there's an Orientalism that sort of gets in the way of Americans understanding China as well as they should. Yes, and it's not just Americans. I think the entire West subject to the same, you know, same orient. I I I'd probably do not want to use the word Orientalism, but uh, subject to the same delusion. Um, like today, when I was looking at the Twitters, um, China has this. A couple of years ago, China initiated this huge infrastructure project called the uh, One Road, One Belt. Mm. Um, Actually, could you just briefly describe that? Because I think that's very important. Yes. Okay. So it's basically, it was the president Xi's, uh, it's really a foreign policy initiative disguised as an infrastructure initiative. So basically, China will lend money or help um, countries alongside this ancient uh, Silk Road to help them develop infrastructures. Mm-hmm. Um but in return, many countries, especially many poor countries along this route, uh, will either borrow money from China and then let China use their ports, use their key, you know, strategic assets, mm-hmm. like natural assets. And also, uh, according to the contract, they have to use a Chinese company. So basically, this is China's way to not only expand the global influence, but also outsourcing their overcapacity in terms of, uh, you know, like a steel, cement, or mm. those industries, you know, stuff, keep the Chinese economy going. So, so, so they're, they're selling stuff. So the Silk Route was the route overland for in the Middle Ages from Europe to China, where European monarchs and so forth bought silk. And they're using this metaphor for for developing economic contacts essentially with Asia and Africa. 
Right. So like it's already happened in several countries like like Sri Lanka, mm-hmm. where it's, it's a small country. It uh, China's you know lend the mon- lend the Sri Lanka money to build a port, but because the Sri, Sri Lanka cannot pay the money back, now China basically get a 99 year very cheap lease to use a strategic port, which China China's you know navies can send their you know ships there. Mm-hmm. So, so m- many countries gradually starting to realize, oh, this is not really just about infrastructure. This is about China's, you know, as a rising new empire, try to expand its global influence. China want the resources. China want the access to strategic ports and the strategic locations. You know, China really extending its military and, you know, and everything out, outward. So this is all part of a, that's why I'm saying it's more a, more of a foreign policy initiative rather than infrastructure. But for but because of the delusion from the West, it really took a while for countries to recognize what this really is. Because initially, many countries take this as a, oh, it's so nice for China to build infrastructures. It's really, it's, it's much more than that. Okay, the, the, there's uh, a kindness that perhaps comes with strings. One figure that I was very startled to read was that there's two million Chinese people on the continent of Africa involved in various economic mm-hmm. and government activities. Uh, but also we have seen criticism of President Trump, for example, for the number of billionaires in his cabinet, for the number of very close connections he has with business and uh, other presidents and other uh, people, actually not just in the United States, have been criticized for this, for excessive closeness with big business. Isn't it the case that China is just not having that division at all, that the there's almost no separation between the political power and the economic power, that the Chinese Communist Party has become a economic entity which is making itself wildly wealthy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why corruption, you know, is very bad in China because you cannot be a business and be successful without working together with, the, you know, fulfill the needs from the government. And uh, there are many reports about the government officials, even some reports about the President Xi, that his relatives, family members running business, you know, overseas have mentions, you know, things like that. So it, it's absolutely a, a big problem of a corruption, you know, in, in China where business and uh, uh, government officials really working, you know, together. And but But ultimately, it's the... It's the government really finally call the shots because, you know, they, they can make you rich, but they can also make you bend your knees if you don't follow the, follow the government's, you know, directives. Um, so that's why you will see sometimes like ZTE, the a Chinese business who's sanctioned by the United States. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's because, yeah, it, it, even though ZTE insists it's a private business, but in China, you don't really have private, private business, like how we define in the, in the West. And the government, you know, can demand the private business to do things that serve the government needs. So that's why it makes many Western countries very wary of uh, dealing with Chinese firms, especially large firms, because you know they are working closely with the government. So that is a, you know, that is a big problem. Helen Rally, author, speaker, and uh, expert on Chinese affairs. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you for having me. If you like the Challenging Opinions podcast, please rate and review the show on iTunes and other podcast providers. Share it on Facebook and Twitter. Tell your friends. But most important, make your view heard. Email podcast at challengingopinions.com. Go to the website for sources and links to Helen's books and articles. And while you're there, please like the show on Facebook, follow at Challenging O on Twitter, and follow Helen Rally at HRally Speaks. And get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or topic for a future show. Also, you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone, or by email. It's all at www.challengingopinions.com. And I do now have a Patreon account, so if you'd like to support the podcast, I'd really appreciate that. All of the details are on the website. Coming up next Monday, that's July 23rd, I'll be talking about media new and old and where it's all going with the podcaster and USC academic Henry Jenkins. 
The Changing Opinions podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. Thank you for listening.